Vandals hit the church. What? Vandals. They came and they got into my shed. They got my tools. They got my ladders. They climbed up in my tree. They chopped them down. <laughs> and then they were nice enough to dig. <laughs> Today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday and our trimming of the palms, we have all sorts of decorations to remind us that on Palm Sunday, Jesus fulfilled one of the prophecies where he rode into Jerusalem. And as he rode in, the people stood out in the hallways, in the corridors, in the streets, and they shouted, Who's that? And as they cry out, save us, they're not just whispering. They're doing it so loud that the religious leaders of the group say, tell your disciples to be quiet. They chastise Jesus. Shame on you. And Jesus looked up to them and said, what's the use? Because if they're quiet, even the rocks, the birds, the trees, they will shout out in praise. Now, I've never seen a rock talk. I have seen movies where they have rock monsters, and they have rock trolls, and they have rock whatever. And I've, I've never gone squatching, but it's one of my bucket lists. That's where you dress up in a ghillie suit and you go out and you sit in the forest waiting for Sasquatch. Bigfoot to go by. And you have your cameras and you're ready. But meanwhile, the snakes, the rodents, the insects are all over you. But you're trying to sit and be as quiet as possible because you know a simple move will scare away the Bigfoot. Right? <laughs> well, I think it's just the time to go be one with nature and take a nap. Uh, put a trail camera up there and hope you catch something. I don't know. But everybody's seen something that goes out there. <laughs> but here, if a tree falls in the forest, let's make a sound. We ask that question. Well, here, the trees will make a sound. The rocks will cry out. Even when people are silent, creation groans. Creation crawls out, calls out. And that's a good thing. As we look at the scriptural parts of Holy Week, we see that there are multiple sections. And as, as we prepare this final week of Lent, I'd like just to do a quick reminder of some of the challenges we have gone through. When Ash Wednesday happened, I said, hey, pray about it. Let the Spirit speak to you. And if something of God comes out and says, you know what, you need to stop doing this, you need to start doing that, then be prepared to do so. So some people started looking at, okay, no chocolate, no TV, no internet, no whatever, no work. <laughs> people tried different things. And then I lowered the boom, doubled down, the following Sunday. And each Sunday I've given us an additional challenge. One of those challenges has been fasting. Don't eat for a period of time, for five days. Oh. And then, silence and solitude. See if you can pick one out 
and just be shh. Now, some of you may be driven mad by that. There's a service in the Quaker tradition. They're currently called the Friends. They, the Quakers, I guess, was a bit too, they scared people off. So there's a church called the Friends. So if you ever hear a friend church, it's the old Quakers. And they regularly have what's called the service of silence. So they come into this room. If you're sick, you're not allowed, you can't have coughs. They put little areas in the side where you go. And you sit in silence for one four hours. Most of you are like, I'm out. Nope. Can't do it. And the purpose is for you to quiet around yourselves and to be in, uh, intentional on trying to hear the word of God. Now, most people not offer a nap. That's why the four-hour section is there, so that when you wake up, you can recalibrate yourself. Some people, but they're focused. But you want to hear the word of God without the outside distractions. So we tried this portion of solitude, silence. And then we tried repentance. And we tried to find the things in our life where we're going to turn from and go in a different direction. We also looked at a single instance of almsgiving, where you find something and you support it financially with your time or something. Somewhere that is less fortunate than yourself. Um, an interesting instance of this uh, it happened later uh, for me. Uh, it was at, at a supermarket, and, and I, I'm I'm okay with losing my reward in heaven for sermon examples. Please don't think I'm any better than any of you because of what I choose to do. Uh, but for as a sermon illustration, I, I was in a store. There was a guy uh, taller than me, but he had a beard, and I think he identified with me because I had a beard. And he's like, hey, I, uh, I'm a little short. You think you can help me? I only have a few things. And when he meant short, he didn't have a dime. But I didn't mind. I was done with my shopping. I had a few things. It was just like a sandwich, an energy drink. And I said, yeah, go right ahead. And then when he heard that, all of a sudden a couple more things added in the basket. But I wasn't, that wasn't a problem. The guy needed food. And so I gave, I gave what he wanted. I didn't give him canned beets without a can opener. I mean, here, have some food. You can't open it, you don't like it. Throw it somewhere. <laughs> but but I, I gave this to him. There wasn't any problem. And it's amazing <coughs> the amount of times when we are open that opportunities present themselves. Now, coming off the freeways, that's one thing. But just day to day living, you encounter somebody who needs something somewhere. And sometimes it's something as simple as eye contact or a smile. Now, if you wear a mask, you don't only get to show your smiles, but you do get to smile with your eyes from time to time. And it's amazing you know, in our society, man, don't, don't make eye contact. You start walking down the street, you see something, look at your phone. This, this is our society. We're going to have a hunchbacks and neck aches when we get older. You know, carpal tunnel with the wrist by the time we're 15. We're all these hunchbacks. I mean, we're going to see what happens to society over a period of time. I remember I saw a, um, uh, it, was a it was an evolution ad of saying for evolution. It was saying that in uh, 50 years, everyone's going to have this extra thumb for the control alt delete. You just have to have that extra piece. But now that's gone away on the computer. We don't need that little stub. We can uh, easily just boop. Our little phones are all right there. But needless to say, opportunities present themselves. And then we looked at forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an easy task. Forgiveness means someone done did you wrong. And you are going to join Team Taylor or Team Elsa. And you're either going to shake it off <laughs> or you're going to let it go. you got to do that when it comes to forgiveness. 
Because many of us want to hold that thread. We have a jacket or a sweater of hatred and bitterness, and we give it away and hold that thread. Some of us are naturally grumpy people. I'd like to encourage us this week as our challenge to use Scripture. And I'd like us to look at Holy Week as this time of Scripture. Now, there are a lot of different recommendations that I can give you. I can give you your reading list, and if you'd like, I can send you a personalized one. You can begin in Luke 19. You can begin in Matthew 21. You can begin in Mark 11. And you can begin in John 12. My request is that none of you read all of them and try to be this gallant savior and this person who's just, I, I've got it all. Just pick one. Start with Luke 19. And I, I can send you these. Pastor, what, what's the reading list you think is best for me? And I can send you a good set. And if you read one of these sections a day, some of them are whole chapters, it'll take you as five to ten minutes. And if you're not a good reader, you want to hit the audio book, there's plenty of opportunities for that. But as we approach Easter, this whole thing of Lent has been challenging ourselves to get closer to Jesus so that upon the resurrection, all of the suffering that we've been under taking and enduring goes away. And the suffering can be turned into celebrating. Now, Good Friday is a time in which we remember the death, the sadness. In fact, if we go back to the creation story, we know that on the seventh day, God rested. On the seventh day, the Sabbath, Jesus was in the tomb. Some people say when you die, you're sleeping, you're resting. Well, Jesus was not here. I sometimes look at that, that section, day seven, God rested. And I wonder how long God rested. I think God's kind of busy. He's always got something to do. And God's just going to stop. And I wonder what happened to all of creation during that period of time. When God's resting, did he say, you're on your own? Is that when Adam and Eve done do? No. God was resting. What happened? Well, here Jesus is resting. What happened? As you look at this section and these part, these portions of Scripture, it's going to lend you a little bit of snapshots, something that happened years and years ago, to the reason why you are here today. You are here today because someone in your household either dragged you here, or you chose to be here, and we are in this building because of Jesus Christ. Whether you like it or not like it, you are here today because of that man, Jesus Christ. And not because of his crucifixion, but because of his resurrection. And so I encourage you this week, every day, starting today, starting tomorrow, read a passage of scripture that is the portion of holy. And that would be the time in which Jesus enters in Palm Sunday and goes through to the time he's resurrected. Now, in there, there will be a couple moments of teaching. You know, I, think I can skip over that one. I just want to know the narrative of what was happening. Uh, I can, again, I can give you a reading guide. Just send me a message or give me a call. Or you can tell me afterwards, Pastor, I want a reading guide tailored to me. And within an hour, uh, I will look at the scriptures, I will pray about it, and I will let you know what uh, God lets me know, and you can say, no, 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 that's not the one I wanted. Give me, give me that one. Okay, fine, why'd you ask? <laughs> Whatever you want, I will provide. 
And I, and I say this because I want you to be able to take the time, take the commitment to say, all right, I'm going to figure this out. Because there are four Gospels that give a different account of this. Just as there are multiple people who are here today, you're all going to have different accounts. I mean, the people who are sitting over here, there's a branch. And they're like, well, I kind of saw a left arm. I'm not really sure if he even had a right side of the face today. People on this side are going to see the opposite. People in the middle are going to see something else. And so now we've got three different stories based on the side in which you sit in. None of you are wrong. None of you are more right than the other. That is your perspective. And as we look at the Gospels, we will see the perspective of those who report. And now, in this discipline, maybe you weren't able to be successful in fasting. Maybe you weren't able to be successful in silence, solitude. Maybe you weren't even able to be acceptable in repentance, all giving, or forgiving. Your acceptance, your success, your anger, it just didn't happen. Don't try to go back and do it all this week. What's done is done. And my prayer is that we can be faithful for those who choose to commit to read these passages. That way, when we come together next week for Easter, we all will have been going on this journey. We've been reading these passages, and that we will all have our own epiphanies, and we can see each other on Sunday and say, Happy Easter! I got this from the Bible. Happy Easter! I got this! Happy Easter! I got that. And all of it should be in the culmination of the resurrection, the ascension, the death, the dinner, washing of the feet, the entrance to Jerusalem. So many different things. But if reading or listening is just not for you, not this year, then I ask that you would pray for those who would endeavor with this. Because if we are faithful, when we read through this, God will bless us as individuals, as families, and as a church. Right. And if this church has the blessing of God, then there will be people who need Jesus that will interact with somebody who is a part of this church. And hopefully, they will hear about Jesus. I'd like to read you one passage. I'd like to read you from Matthew chapter 21 today. This isn't a cheat. Some of you are going to get to read it again. <laughs> Don't count this today because I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'm just going to read a small portion to remind us of the importance of this. As we saw today, as we sang in one of our songs today, the King is coming. That had two saw that was twofold. A, when the king came in to Jerusalem riding in the cult of a donkey, but also a reminder that the king will be coming again. He's not a one and done, but Jesus will be returning in a cloud. But as they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethlehem to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey there, tied up with their colts. Unite them and bring them to me. To untie them and bring them to me. If anyone has anything to you, say that the Lord needs them. And he will send them right away. I'm just going to pause right there. If you've got a truck and you've got a trailer, and someone pulls up to your house and hooks your trailer up to your truck and starts taking it, and you say, hey, 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 and they said, hold up, the master has needed it. <laughs> God's got to be working in that master's heart. That man was probably looking for some sort of a sign. And when this, this came and happened, he probably, that's what I was looking for. 
This isn't something that's going to apply to everybody. And these guys weren't going around wandering around being horse thieves. Okay? There was some sort of symbolism here, and it happened. The Lord has needed it. The Master has needed it. And he will send them right away. Now this took place to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and a colt, and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees. And they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered him, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. There's a lot more to the story that happened. But we celebrate Palm Sunday because it reminds us of the triumphal entry. Some of you have had triumphal entries. You uh, did something for your family. And you walk in, raising your hands, I look what I have done. Oh, I'm so gracious. Perhaps you made a certain dinner. Oh, I'm so good. Perhaps you found the last item that people were looking for. Maybe it was that Cabbage Patch Kid back in the 80s. Maybe it was something else. And you come walking in. I'm the hero. Maybe it was the conquering hero. Maybe you have a little fanfare. Maybe, maybe I want to even have a little confetti can. <laughs> Walk on in and pop. Maybe you have trained your dogs to bow when you come in. I don't know. But at some point in your life, some of you know what it's like to be celebrated as a hero. And here Jesus is coming in and he's being celebrated. And this is a reminder that Jesus is not just this meek and mild carpenter, builder guy who just takes one on one cheek and on the other cheek and just dirty, blah, 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 blah. But no, he is a king. And he is to be treated as such. Jesus is our friend, but he is also our king. That is why a monarchy is the best form of government. Because God is not the president. God is not the emperor. God is the king. And in this monarchy, what he says goes. It's not a bureaucracy. Where there's people trying to get stuff done and other people have agendas and it just never happens because they keep butting heads. It's not a democracy where one person has a say and another person has a say. God has the say. But because he is holy, because he is righteous, because he is good, we can trust that what he has to say will be best. Right. Humans were screwed up. We're, we're a mess. That's why human monarchies fail regularly. There are scandals to the Lord. And then they have little people who work under them who screw things up even more. But Jesus is a king. And we should praise him as a king of our life. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we ask you to to convict us of our sin. Convict us of what is wrong. So that we might know what is good. So that we might fill our lives with your spirit and your goodness. We ask Heavenly Father for your peace as we prepare for Holy Communion. Lord, at this time, may your spirit fill.
fill our spirit and commune with us. As we prepare to participate in the last meal you had while you were here on this earth, as we enter in the Holy Week, may this communion be special. We are reminded of your resurrection. May we take this moment of silence, Lord. May your Spirit speak to us. And if there's anything separating us from you now, we might be whole. Dear Jesus, I thank you for revealing the truth to us. For those who seek you out, you will be found. We ask, Heavenly Father, as we participate in communion today, that these elements, 